Hello, everyone, and welcome to McDonough's Assembly. Um, we are delighted to have one of our alums today, Zach Barber, um, and some pretty remarkable guests he's lined up for us. Um, before we get started, let me tell you a little about Zach. Um, Zach started at McDonough in fifth grade along with his twin sister, Ariel, um, and graduated in 2006. He then went to Emory University where he graduated Beta Gamma Sigma, which is um, a business honor society with a BBA in finance. And then he earned an MBA from Wharton Business School at Penn. Um, Zach is currently working as a financial advisor um, on the Garber Wealth Management team at Alex Brown in Baltimore. Um, when he is not in his office, Zach um, is an active member of Baltimore's, um, a number of Baltimore's community organizations, including the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, where he's a part of a Young Leadership Council. He is also a part of the Living Classrooms, the Foundation's Rising Stars Program, and involved in a nonprofit organization volunteer untapped. Um, further, uh, Mr. Garber hosts um, Charm City Dreamers, um, an inspiring podcast about everyday heroes of Baltimore. Um, and we will actually be a part of his um, show today. So um, thank you, Zach. I, I, um, before you introduce your guests, I, I have a question um, that I love to ask our alums, um, and that is if you can share a favorite McDonough memory, a favorite teacher, a favorite uh, tradition, or maybe a favorite place on campus. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I can't see everyone who's participating, but I'm so excited to be here with everyone. I have so many fond memories of uh, McDonough, I can tell you, I remember always going into uh, the chemistry room with Mr. Shang and uh, was there for extra activities. And uh, he was definitely a pivotal part of my McDonough experience. Also played soccer and tennis. So being out on the fields, the access to the facilities that you guys have is truly unmatched and unbelievable. So you should all feel proud and um, really honored to, to have that opportunity. Um, so I guess as, as Nancy mentioned, um, outside of my work at, at Alex Brown, I, um, I ended up meeting a few people in Baltimore that really changed my life. And it led to me starting a nonprofit called the Francis Scott Key Society, which is a, a networking group with individuals under 45 about how we can make a difference in the community. And ultimately, I thought it would be interesting to share some of their points of views with the public, and that led to this podcast, Charm City Dreamers. And today, this episode's actually going to end up being live on our, our podcast stream. So, Zach, I'm going to um, let you take over and introduce our guests, and then um, we do have the chat room available for our upper schoolers. If they do have a question, um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end where they can um, be answered. So, uh, feel free to chime away, we'll be behind the scenes getting those questions teed up for, um, for Zach. And um, welcome to all of our guests. I'm gonna let um, Zach take over though and, and introduce you all. Perfect, so we'll start with the introductions, but, but before we get there, I think the, the key takeaways today is we wanna figure out ways to show some really great young leaders and how you guys can tangibly get engaged in their efforts, because I understand that you have the senior projects coming up. And I'll just mention that if there's anyone who wants to be part of the, the Charm City Dreamer podcast, we're always looking for somebody to help with the website and with going through the interviews, and I'd be happy to you know be able to participate with that. So today we have three amazing guests. Um, these are all past podcast guests that we have as well. So you can always check out if you're interested in learning more of the podcasts I did with them. Uh, first, we have Van Brooks. Van was born and raised in West Baltimore and had dreams of being a professional athlete. Many of you may have uh, had similar dreams. Um, 
However, while playing a football game for Loyola Blakefield, Van suffered a severe spinal cord injury that left him paralyzed from the neck down. Despite that, he used his experience as motivation to found a nonprofit, the Safe Alternative Foundation, which is the, a youth facility called the Safe Center. It's truly incredible. I've, I've had the honor of working with Van on a few things. The second person that we have is David Estrin. He's the founder um, and CEO of Together We Remember, which is a nonprofit dedicated to empowering the next generation of leaders to make never again a reality. He's the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. David is on a mission to transform memory into action, to end anti-Semitism and broader bigotry worldwide. Really important, April is actually Genocide Awareness Month, and he's currently planning multiple live vigils. So we thought this was particularly prescient right now. Last and not least is Alicia Wilson. Alicia is the vice president for the Office of Economic Development at Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System in Baltimore. She leads a core team driving Hopkins strategy and initiative as an anchor institution in and around Baltimore to figure out how to elevate and expand the institution's commitment to the city through its investments in economic and neighborhood development, healthcare, and education. Previously, she was instrumental to securing one of the largest TIFs in U.S. history, which was for the Port Covington Project. Um, and, and prior to that, she was actually the youngest partner at Gordon Feinblatt, which is a local law firm. So I um, want to say thank you to all of our guests. I think a great starting point would be just to share kind of what you're working on and specifically on everyone's mind right now is the COVID crisis and some of the things you're dealing with. So why don't we go in the order that I introduced you? So starting with Van, could you just share a little background and maybe some projects you're working on today? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, Zach, thanks for having me. Uh, again, my name is Van Brooks. I'm the founder of Safe Alternative. And what we're currently working on is um, we just launched a Together We Can campaign um, actually yesterday. And Together We Can is bringing all of our programs that we typically do um, in person virtually. And so starting next week, we're going to be um, doing a lot of virtual programs that will be available to any and everyone. Awesome. Uh, David, if you could share a little bit, we'd go from Together We Can to Together We Remember. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. And I think the point there that's so important is that we are living through an unprecedented moment calling for unity. And so whether it's Van's work on the front lines in Baltimore or my work um, here in Baltimore, but also in communities around the world that are facing identity-based violence, um, the point is that we have to come together. We have a unique opportunity um, in this moment in which we can't come together as often physically, but we still need to do so virtually. And so with respect to my story, um, as you mentioned, all four of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Um, and I was brought to my grandpa's concentration camp with him when I was 13 years old, right after my bar mitzvah, my Jewish coming of age celebration. And that's really when I woke up as a young person to uh, the power of collective memory to inspire collective action. So that led to a long journey which ultimately culminated in, um, actually, I just want to mention that this year is 75 years since the liberation of the concentration camps uh, during World War II, during the Holocaust. And so this year we're celebrating or commemorating 75 years. And so, um, you know, I just want to acknowledge that it's an important moment. And, um, you know, when I, I, I met the, the men of the 11th Armored Division that freed my grandpa, and, so the, and we just celebrated Passover, which is all about liberation as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the work that we've been doing is we've organized over a hundred, uh, um, remembrance vigils in communities across the world in nine countries. And I did all this work because my grandpa passed away when I was a third year student at Duke university. And I said, well, what now, what do I do in this moment? And we hosted our first vigil on Duke's campus. And the small innovation was that we read names of victims, not just from the Holocaust, but of different genocides, which brought people from different groups together. And now that's what we're doing. And around the world, um, all these folks were gonna have to cancel their Holocaust remembrance and genocide remembrance events. And so we've been helping them move all of their events online and virtual um, around the world. Awesome. Uh, Alicia, if you could share what's going on at Hopkins. And I think what would also be helpful is just share a little bit about your two experiences leading up to Hopkins as well, because I think it's, it's a truly remarkable story, uh, what, what you've been able to accomplish at such a young age. Sure. Um, thank you, Zach, for having me. Um, 
But I would say is what I'm doing now at Hopkins is really leading all of our COVID-19, um, both internal and external um, efforts around, one, our employees, really caring for them and their families and addressing the needs um, that have arisen uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, all of our work um, externally. So with our community partners, our small businesses, our vendors, as well as um, uh, community residents on a whole host of issues, um, been a great, uh, had a great deal of involvement in um, the work around standing up a public-private partnership, uh, as well as all of our efforts um, that we're undertaking to ensure that individuals are informed, um, that they have the correct not, um, understanding of COVID-19 and how to prevent the spread and flatten the curve ultimately. Um, so I always feel like I come into a new um, position uh, at just the right moment. Um, and so um, coming into Hopkins during uh, a pandemic um, is sort of a critical moment, which uh, in many respects, you know, I find it a blessing to be working alongside men and women who literally, you know, saving lives on a daily basis. Um, I went to Port Covington right at the, you know, at the height of the, t the TIF um, and, um, you know, the community impact work, ensuring that, you know, communities were a part of the deal, that comprehensive deal. And then um, at, Port, at um, you know, being a partner in a law firm, really having the opportunity to work alongside men and women who um, are doing, we're doing well, you know, doing well financially, but also doing so much good in our community through, you know, creating and supporting, you know, things such as Center Stage and, you know, Baltimore Child Abuse Center. So all of those things, I think, have helped me to have a, an amazing um, career thus far and hopefully more to come. And Alicia, one of your superpowers is your positive energy that you bring to every situation. One of, one of the things that um, we like to discuss is, you know, sharing a time where you overcame adversary um, and something difficult and how you, you know, maybe, maybe you even want to share um, a little bit about your high school experience, how you got to where you are today, because I think you even said on our, our interview that this was yeah. never something, you know, you never would have imagined where you are today when you were, um, you know, in, in, in these uh high schooler shoes at the age of, you know, 14 to 17. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, um, I can say when I was, you know, the age of many of the students who are attending this, um, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, be a lawyer, didn't actually went to Mervo, which is a trade school, principally because I didn't think I could go straight from high school to college. I wanted to have a trade to be able to take care of myself and my family. Um, and thankfully, you know, an organization called College Bound really intervened in my high school years and helped me to really get on a path to going to college and ultimately law school. I went to college on a full scholarship and law school on a full scholarship. And I can tell you as a high school student, those were beyond my wildest dreams. It really was pivotal for me to be aligned with uh, organizations and people who believed in me in many respects before I believed in myself. And so you know, having those pivotal moments and critical moments at, you know, a young age, I think, um, were tremendous. And, you know, in many respects, in many of the places where I find myself, sometimes I'm the youngest, sometimes I'm the only woman, sometimes I'm the only person of color. And really viewing that um, as an asset and realizing how I can bring others like myself into the fold, into those tables and into those platforms but also not um, recognizing that diversity, the power of diversity is using your voice in those spaces to make room for others. So that's been you know, a part of my journey of overcoming adversity. Thanks. Uh, Van, uh, Van has many superpowers. Van, uh, I think one of the things that inspires me daily about you, and I'm, I'm so honored to have you as a friend, is how you manage to turn a tragedy. Um, you know, you were a top recruit in uh, for college football, thinking about the pros, and ended up being paralyzed from the neck down. And rather than looking at a dark situation, you turned it to into into your career and what you've accomplished with your life. Could you just share how you continue to see the light and were able to use such a horrific experience to to really help shape others and make a positive impact? 
Absolutely. You know, um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, when things happen, it's meant to happen, um, even if you don't quite understand why. And so for me, it was, um, I had two options. And my options, the first one was I, I deal with it. The other one was I don't deal with it. And at the age of 16, um, and, and still being an athlete and having that mentality, I told myself that I was going to recover from it, no matter how long it was going to take. And so I set out to deal with it. And over the time of me just trying to do my best to recover from my injury, uh, I started to find the answer to the why me, right? I used to always question why was I the one to get injured when I had so much going for myself. And I found my purpose in it all. I, I understood why I was the one that was chosen and why I had to go through those things. And it was preparing me for all the work that I'm currently doing now. Um, and so, and finding my purpose and tragedy has, has really, you know, saved my life, but also changed my life. And it's allowing me to use the things that I've gone through to, to help so many other people, something that I would have never imagined. Thanks. Um, David, I think one of the things that we don't think about, it's, you know, we live in this age of startup culture. Uh, and there's lots of startups and startups are extremely difficult. We only hear about the success. It's even more difficult when you have a startup in the nonprofit space. Could you just share a time where you felt like everything was going wrong and how you managed to persevere? I know you recently, you know, you've always been doing these vigils, but you've recently fully converted to virtual. Maybe share some of that experience, you know, contemplating and trying to grow something to be successful and scalable. Yeah, I was actually, I was thinking ahead to what, you know, which direction I would take this. And I was thinking about the startup experience with Together We Remember. Um, first off, you know, there was a storm in the decision making process and making the leap to quit a really, you know, solid job as a business strategy consultant. Um, fortunately, I have enough of the privilege where I can make that leap and take that risk. But it was still a scary prospect to completely alter your life to think about building a nonprofit organization long term. And then once you do that, you're like, okay, I'm on the other side, but then there's no one with me. There's no one with you yet. Um, and that's a, a scary part as well. So you have to kind of wade out into the water on your own for a while and hope that your positive energy will attract others. And then when you do that, even once you've already done incredible things, right, I got to speak at the United Nations a year ago and I thought, okay, I'm here, I made it. And yet you're like, well, can I still fundraise? Can I still do all the hard work that's necessary to pay myself, to, to pay the bills? So you can still have these incredible wins and you look around, you're like, is there anyone here yet? You still? Um, but eventually if you keep showing up, uh, and you keep persevering and most importantly, ask for help when you need it most. Don't be afraid to ask for help. There are so many people that are waiting to say yes to you, but you have to ask the question. And I wanted to share a, a quote that I just asked my fiance to pass over to me that I have on the wall. And it's from a poem called On Deliberative Practice. And it says, you might not know enough, but teach anyway. You might not see clearly enough, but make a move anyway. You might not be good enough, but show your work anyway. And that's by Thomas Opong. And so I look at that every day and know that I may feel inadequate or not worthy of this moment and of this work, but you just got to keep showing up and, um, and do your best and then, you know, hope that it's all going to work out. Um, as Van says, you know, there's, there's perhaps a bigger plan here and I'm just trying to show up to, uh, to make it happen. On the virtual front, that was honestly an easy switch. I've been doing a lot of that sort of work for a while. Um, and in the very first vigil, the dream was to go global and to do this work, not just in our communities, but to show it online. And so it took a global pandemic to get everyone to say, oh, maybe we should do something online. So I'm gonna take the wins where I can get them in this moment. I think that's great advice. Um, and it's a, it's a good segue into my next question. I'm going to ask specifically Alicia and Van, in terms of the key elements to your success, maybe share a few key qualities as well as what are some things that you would recommend to students in high school that are trying to build up their skill sets, you know, for their future. So uh, let's, let's start with Van. Uh, so I would say, um, you know, determination, be, be, being very determined to, um, to, to be successful at whatever it is that you're setting out to do. Um, the next one, you know, I, I would say um, to be, to be um, have internal motivations, right? 
um, at times, especially in my case, when I was dealing with my injury and, and as well as going into things professionally, uh, the outside world was, was harsh at times, very harsh. Um, people around me were very harsh at times and that, that was taking its toll on me, but I had to dig within myself and find the motivation within myself. Um, you know, like Dave said, I, I am worthy of this and I, I can do this. And I just need to build the confidence up within myself that no matter what's coming my way, no matter, no matter what challenges get in front of me, I will be able to overcome it. And it's not a matter of um, I don't have the skills. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of I don't have the skills right now. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to go out and learn those things. And I'm willing to meet the people who can help me um, get to where I need to be. And so I would definitely say, you know, just having that determination and that internal motivation to push through no matter what the obstacles will be. Yeah, determination and then surrounding yourself and being able to ask the right questions, the right people to, and getting that support, realizing it's not just you, that you're part of a broader community is so important. Um, Alicia, uh, what pieces of advice would you give as well as what were key elements to your success in your career? I think um, the key advice I would give is to um, recognize the value of today and not really thinking that um, so many things happen far off in the future. So I'll give you an example. Many times people say, I will ask young people, they'll ask, you know, adults, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be known for? What's your legacy? And the reality is that that doesn't happen somewhere or far off in the future. Like, who do you want to be when you grow up? You are, you, there is no grow up period, right? You, whoever you want to be, you are building today. The character traits you want to be known for, you are building today. You want to be known as a hardworking individual, someone that is kind and pathetic, someone that gets things done, you better do it today. It's not somewhere off in the future for you to do those things. The second thing I would say is don't give in to the fiction that you are in competition with some artificial timeline, right? So you, you, you see your friends doing things at certain moments and you say, oh, I'm behind or I'm ahead. Um, you need to be on pace with yourself. You need to be competing with yourself. You need to be becoming better you because your journey is so unique um, and you need to not compare yourself with others which can either make you arrogant or make you depressed. Um, you need to be really honing on who you are and take the time to live in this moment. It doesn't come again. And all these things that most people will tell you are far off in the future, you have to do today. That's, that's all great advice and really appreciate the words of wisdom. I'm learning from the, the, these friends of mine every single day. Before, um, I, I want to make sure we try to make it interactive and get to a few of your questions. But before we get to that, um, really quickly, if each speaker could lay out maybe a tangible way or two that the McDonough community and specifically maybe some of the high school students can engage with their work in the community and we'll go in reverse. So Alicia, if you want to start with some ways that people can get engaged with the efforts that you're doing right now. So first of all, if you want to volunteer, I'm going to give you a website and I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, it's jsu.edu slash COVID-19 community support. If you have some talent, something to offer, I, and it doesn't have to be money. It can be a skill and ability. If you let us know, we have so many needs in the community. We have so many needs internally. Let us know. And if we can't, if we can't use your talents, we will connect you with someone like Van, who another great community partner. And so um, that's the greatest way, contribute in your very own unique way to the efforts we're trying to do around a whole home. Awesome. And, and we'll also provide in a follow-up, I'm sure Jen or, or Nancy or someone on, on the McDonough team will provide uh, follow-up contact info. We're, we're all a resource for you and you shouldn't be shy to reach out. We're here to, we're here to help. Um, Van, could you just share some ways that people can engage with SAFE and the efforts that you're doing? Yes, I'll also give our website um, and I'll put it in the chat, but uh, safealternative.org. And as I mentioned, out together, we can campaign launch and we'll be offering virtual programming. And so if anyone has, as Alicia said, any skills or talents that they would like to offer 
um, to, to people, please let us know. Um, and I'll also, I'm also a connector. And so if we can't directly help you, I'll definitely connect you with someone uh, who can. Uh, another thing that we're doing is all of our students, we offer virtual um, mentoring and virtual tutoring. And so if you're interested in, in tutoring um, a student, please let us know that as well. And I've actually gone to the Safe Center with Van. He works with some incredible middle middle school students and is always looking uh, for mentors and other people to help. And you are all in uh, such a privileged position having gone to McDonough and have incredible resources and knowledge that you can offer these students. So highly recommend engaging. Uh, David, could you just share maybe um, some of the things that you're doing now? One of the reasons we really wanted to have you is April is uh, your Super Bowl in terms of uh, the virtual events that you're doing um, and ways that people can engage with what it is you are doing. Yeah, definitely. So first off, we have a ton of virtual events that we are crowdsourcing from Holocaust, genocide, and human rights museums and organizations from all over the country and increasingly around the world listed on our website. Um, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day is coming up. So there's gonna be a number of really inspiring programs. I'm actually keynoting the Los Angeles, like the city of Los Angeles's um, Holocaust Remembrance Day program this Sunday. And if it weren't for this crisis, it's kind of crazy the silver lining is now we can take one city's programs and offer them to anyone around the world who can click on a button. Um, so feel free to tune in for any of those programs, but I'm also excited to share that many of our programs are youth are youth led and youth centered. So after this at four o'clock today, I've got a DC based group called Fly by Light that does incredible anti violence work. They're hip hop artists and poets, and they're going to be ciphering music with us at four o'clock today. So you can hop on our website, sign up and see what we're talking about in terms of turning remembrance into action. Second, um, uh, well, also, I should say on the 30th of April, we are doing a 24 hour global virtual vigil, unprecedented, never done before between museums and centers all around uh, the world. And um, I see someone in the chat is asking what, uh, what uh, is the author and title of this quote? It's Thomas Opong. I didn't want to forget that. And it's called On Deliberative Practice. But back to my answer. I'm easily distractible, as you can tell. Um, 24 hour virtual event, check that out on 30th. Hopefully it'll be in the news if we do our jobs. Second, volunteering. I have a 17 year old student in Indiana running my Instagram right now, because I don't know how to use Instagram. So if anyone is social media savvy or wants to get involved in how we tell our story, we're also featuring the stories of young people that are on the front lines countering violence and doing bridge building. And then last, um, I just want to plug all the nonprofit organizations out there in terms of if, if there's an organization that you love, I guarantee you right now is a time that a small, donation or contribution will go a very, very long way. It's a very scary time if you are doing social justice, social change work. So whoever it is, um, your support right now would go a long way, whether it's the students on the line or, or families. Um, I just, I think it's important. Like I said, ask for help. We all need help right now. That's excellent. And I think we have about one minute left. So this is going to be really rapid. And if people are able to stay on a couple extra minutes, we can maybe answer some questions. But I'm going to read off a question to each of our speakers. And you have, call it like 20 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds to answer it to the best of your ability. I know it's short. Um, and I'm just going to read them out quickly. And then I'll, I'll, I'll say who's who. So David, how can we as students work to service the Baltimore community and other communities, especially if we feel underrepresented uh, or similar as you felt as, quote, the only or within a group or job? Uh, then um, when you are frustrated or angry, what is one of the best ways you make yourself feel better? And Alicia, uh, I guess somebody listened to our podcast interview, one of the students, they said that you said, quote, uh, that you specialize in the impossible. Can you share a little bit more about that? So David, if you want to take 10 seconds and uh, answer the question and then Van and Alicia. Yeah, there are so many organizations that are already doing the work on the front lines across lines of difference. So show up, volunteer with one of them. And then if you keep showing up, you're going to find the folks uh, that you need to be working with. You're not as lonely as you think you are. You just have to kind of look beyond your typical sphere and, and circle. Great. Van? I'll say... Um, I always remind myself that where I come from, as far as my injury, how far I've come. And I always say that there's always, there's, there's someone that's in the worst situation than what I am. Um, and so I need to be grateful when I need to, you know, kind of calm myself down and, and, and put things into perspective. And Alicia. I try to keep the perspective. If someone else can do it, then I shouldn't do it. I need to do the things that seem impossible 
and there are stretch positions for me. So I specialize in the impossible because um, I think other people think it couldn't be done, but I see the way to get it done. Oh, and I need to give one shout out to Johnny Cool on this. Um, his mom gave me that um, that assignment, so I want to shout out Johnny Cool. <laughs> Thank you, um, Zach, Alicia, Van, David. Um, we can all learn from you um, as as we've all been kind of throwing a curveball here lately. So hopefully we can internalize your message um, and look for ways to rise up and support our community. We we take. We really appreciate you taking time to share your fascinating stories. Um, I just tell everybody, be sure to check out Charm City Dreamers for additional interviews that um, Zach has done on this podcast in the community. Um, and so if it's okay with you, Zach, in keeping with our school tradition, we always end our assemblies by honoring our seniors. And so today I'd like to continue that tradition and just say seniors, you are dismissed. So thanks everyone again. Uh, we really appreciate your time and have a great weekend. Oh, thank you. And I think they'd asked um, if you wanted us to stick around, we're happy to answer if there are a few other questions. Sure, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I just thought they have to get back to class. So I, uh, anyone who can stick around is- Yeah, so I guess if anyone has any specific questions and you wanna throw it in the chat, um, we're happy to uh, be a resource. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so we just got one question from Clem. Um, many children relied on their schools for lunch. What can I do to help these kids? Um, I would think Alicia and Van, you probably have a few perspectives on this. So the number of organizations, well, the city schools are still um, providing lunch um, at designated meal sites um, for families and, and kids. But I would say you know, this is a worthwhile time to really make a donation to the Maryland Food Bank. They are, they are really supplementing in a huge way a number of families throughout um, Baltimore and, and Maryland. And the other is pick one of the smaller organizations like the Men and Family Center, the Door, B. Gaddy's Family Center. They are really filling in the gaps in, the, in a really huge way um, for families across the city. And so there are a number of smaller organizations, um, Central Soul, um, that are serving families in a really robust way. So uh, I'm happy to provide many of them um, to you. Great. And Van, it looks like you got a, a separate question as well. So I right. guess one, I'm curious if any of your children, if you're seeing this and if you guys are providing any of the launches. And then also there's a specific question here about uh, overcoming adversary and disappointment and maybe being told no. Right. So um, to the first, the first one, I'll, I'll um, second what Alicia said, definitely support some of the smarter organizations, um, a really good organization is um, the Baltimore Hunger Project. They've been doing a lot of great work. Um, and then to the, the second question, I'm, I'm, so during the challenging time, what can you share experiences about overcoming adversity? Um, one of the things that I keep in mind, and it, it, it really saved my life, my dad told me this, um, and I still use it till this day, is a person is defeated when they lose, they're defeated when they give up. And as long as um, I, I keep that in my mind and I, I literally, whenever I'm in a difficult time or whenever I get a no, the first thing that comes to my mind is that quote. The next thing that comes to my mind is how can I, right? How can I get a yes from someone or how can I do the things that, um, as Alicia said, it, people may look at it and say it's impossible. Um, so those are the two things that help me day in and day out when dealing with adversity. Awesome. And Kellen, uh, I'm actually going to take, I'll take your question um, about everyone asking about their own timeline and how to gauge yourself. Um, I can tell you one person who had a profound impact on, on myself was Chris Wilson, who I think actually might even speak to you guys next year or another time. But Chris wrote a book called Master Plan, and it's a, a close friend of mine who was sentenced to natural life in prison without parole, who is now doing 
incredible acts all over the world and is a speaker and artist and author. Um, and what I would say is putting together your own master plan and holding yourself accountable and giving yourself an accountability buddy. So what I do is I try to write out as much as possible because when you put words into the universe, when you write them down, those become actions. And so writing down things that you hope to achieve short term, as well as longer term. It's not about, it, it's about attempting to get as far as you can with each of those. Um, so uh, I believe there was one other question before that. So Jesse uh, asked uh, about being in the public eye uh, and what stuck with you um, in terms of venue, audience member experience. Anyone wanna, I'll let you guys chime in. Um. I've had amazing opportunities um, in the public eye. I think really what, um, which is will happen to many of you, you will be individuals who will be on a different stage at almost every level of your life. It really is important to be authentic and to be yourself and not to be a chameleon as you advance and go forward. And that's something I learned from, you know, so many um, that I've come into contact with, whether it be, you know, from Michelle Obama to, you know, to Josephine Wilson, who's my mama, um, really getting to, you know, be authentic, be who you are in all of those, because um, the light, as it gets brighter on you, can try to change you. You need to really, you know, be good in your core as you progress. And I'm still waiting for Alicia's invitation to hang out with Michelle. Um, but uh, David, I see that you, <laughs> David, I see that you have um, uh, an answer to Caitlin's question. You want to chime in? Yeah, yeah. And Caitlin's question was, what would be your advice to seniors and the senior classes they transition out of McDonough and into the world? Um, the most important advice that I put into practice that got me to where I am today is to go as far away as I can, go to places that are uncomfortable, that are different. And often one of the harder lessons I had to learn was that I didn't have to go to the other side of the world to have a life-changing experience to find the other. It was in my community. I was living in Durham and, you know, Duke is a really pretty campus and there's a lot of privilege on the campus. And then you kind of go into the city and you see, you see the reality of what, um, what communities are experiencing. So that was one of my lessons learned is you don't have to go geographically so far away, but it's important to put yourself in places where you seem to think you might not belong to do so with mm -hmm. an open heart, with open ears, very importantly. Um, and that'll, that'll help you find your way as a bridge builder and as an effective collaborator and communicator in, the, in our century that we're living in. And Jack, I think that's a, this is a, a really great question. I like this. I might have to steal this for future podcasts. Um, each of you, if you have a real quick second, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment and why? Keeping it really short. Sure, Alicia, you want to you wanna start? It sounds like you were going to chime in. Uh, I think my greatest accomplishment, and I know this sounds hokey, um, but it really is um, being proud of who I am from a character position, right? So I feel like, you know, I've worked a lot on myself. I prayed a lot. I've, I've tried to become a better person internally. And I think my impulse to do good when you have the choice not to, and um, my impulse to be kind when, when things would tell you not to be, I think, my impulse to have empathy when others would say to be hardened, I think those are some of the greatest accomplishments that, I mean, being at that point in my development, I feel very accomplished to be able to be there. Yeah. yeah. Van? Uh, I, w I would say um, not giving up on myself when, when I felt that the world had, especially in my recovery and uh, ultimately teaching myself to walk again. And David? Uh, personally, getting my fiance to say yes, because that's the most important part of my <laughs> life. As far as like, the whole picture, that's, 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 the, that's the end game right there, is figuring out who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And I think that's important. Yes, this is professional oriented, but I think it's important to call out having that balance in life and finding a support system, someone you can ask for help often from. Um, and we're surviving here in, in quarantine pretty well. Um, but beyond that, professionally, I would say, um, uh, you know, it was surreal to hear ambas former ambassador of the United Nations, Samantha Power, say thank you 
to together we remember for the work that we are doing this month. That, that, that dream was eight years in the making with a lot of complications. And so I'm really proud of, um, of that as sort of like a, a symbol of the work that we've been doing and the work that we're, the value we're providing to the world. And Nancy, um, I don't know if we're, you know, I want to be respectful of time. I know there are some more questions. Well, there's certainly um, uh, a lot more questions that are popping up. And um, I'm thinking um, if you want to continue, I know the kids have to go back to school, I mean, back to class. So um, uh, they'll be dropping off, but uh, we'll be recording this, can send it back out to them. So you can continue answering questions or the other possibility is, uh, we can type up some of your responses and just send that out to the question. So, um, Zach, that's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we have a few minutes. Alicia, Van, or David, if any of you need to drop, drop off. Um, I know I have probably another five to ten minutes or so. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just continue. I'm just looking back up to see if we um, missed anyone's questions. I don't wanna overlook anyone. Okay, so I think the next question, it looks like this was actually specifically asked uh, for Van. This was uh, Joe Raddick. Uh, he said um, that you had discussed not putting all your eggs in one basket uh, and on the podcast actually. What message can you share about diversifying yourself as a person uh, to be a successful all around human? And Joe, is, uh, I was actually just responding to you in the in the chat. Um, so um, I, I would say a lot of times people will say um, having a backup plan, it takes it distracts you from your initial goal. Um, and for me, I say that the path to success isn't a straight line. Mm -hmm. And you may have your you, you know, you may have your initial goal, but you definitely will need alternate routes of, of getting there. And so I think it's very important that you, you in, in diversifying um, your skill sets. It's always how can you become better at the areas that you're not good in that will help you get to your ultimate end goal. Um, so I guess an, an example of that would be, I'm, in my case, it wouldn't necessarily be um, being a professional athlete because that's what I wanted to, to do, right? I wanted to be a professional athlete. I wanted to be around the NFL. Now, I no longer can be a professional athlete due to my physical disability. However, I can still do the things that are, are necessary to be around the NFL, um, right? And so what, what, what types of things would that be? Well, it would be if I was to get into coaching or if I was to get into sharing my story and I wanted to share my story with professional athletes, what are the necessary steps that I need to take to get there? What are the skills that I need to build that will get me to that point? And so motivational speaking, I need to take classes and, and those types of things. And so, and, and, and diversifying, I think just, I just think diversifying your skill sets are very important for you to achieve success um, at the end of the day. Yeah. And I'll just say to uh, Alan's questions, how can you, uh, how can people reach out? We'll share everyone's info. Um, make sure that Jen or Nancy sends an email. Um, I guess it looks like the final question here was from Jack Dudas and he, uh, 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 he, he had one other question. What is your biggest flaw and what tends to hold you back? Um, so I'll let you guys chime in, whoever wants to jump at that one first. I'm happy to go. I sort of alluded to it in, in the poem from Thomas O'Pong, but I think my, you know, what holds me back the most is myself, right? The voice inside my head that says, you know, you're not good enough. Um, or if you put something out there, it's not good enough. Um, and getting through that and um, otherwise flaw um, perfect uh, you know I, I hate saying it but like just the, the 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 drive for perfection whether it's an email to your follower list on your community or whatever it is I tend to get in my own way and Zach and I Zach you and I have spoken about this a ton right it's just like you got to get it out you got to get it done otherwise no one sees what you're doing and you know it's about that journey not just one deliverable or one item so um, just getting out of my own way has been probably one of the best things and finding help and, and trusting people can do their jobs really well. Yep. I would say, I mean, I would say um, it's sort of, um, I, I am like a kid in the candy store. There are many things I love doing um, and really exercising the discipline to, you know, focus on one or two and bringing uh, collaborators, but I think I'm doing better with the collaborator, uh, the, I'm spreading the work out and delegating the work, but 
no, it's, it's really seeing so much need and wanting to address a whole lot of it. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll piggyback off of Alicia again. Um, I mean, there's, there's such a need. And so I'll, I'll say my biggest flaw is not setting enough um, time to myself, not having that personal time to myself. I'm always um, accessible to, to any and everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, it's I need to take care of myself more, um, self-care. And I've actually been spending a lot of this time doing that. Um, and so that's my biggest one, just self-care. Yeah. I think those are all valuable lessons. So I don't know if all the students, they've probably all dropped off now, but really appreciate everybody's time. Um, and as I mentioned, we're more than happy to all be a resource. I'm happy to help. Uh, the nice thing about the project that I've been doing, all of our episodes are live for all of the past guests we've had. If anybody has someone that they'd like us to feature, I'm always readily available. Um, and, you know, my goal, I'll just share in terms of what I do, because this, you know, I do this for fun. I, like I said, I'm a financial advisor. My goal is to build a platform to be the best resource that I can be to the entire community. And this, this is a piece of the, the broader picture in terms of my skill sets and what I can provide. So really appreciate everyone's time. And uh, Nancy, thank you again. Uh, thank and you Jen. all so much. And again, if um, there are even a few extra questions that maybe we didn't get to, I know even prior to the podcast, I had some students reach out. So I might send them your way and maybe we can just uh, do a little follow up uh, with the with the upper school students in the community. No problem. And you Absolutely. have everyone's email. So okay. thank you. Okay, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank we you. We really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.